Welcome, everybody. Welcome again to those who are watching online. I'm especially thankful this week for our tech team. There are a number of people who are likely still unable to come because of all manner of things from the storms last week. Flooding, trees, um, illnesses from being up for hours and hours working on flooding and trees. And I'm so grateful for those in this church community who stepped up this week to help those, even while we had our own needs to, to reach out to those who were in need. There's no greater call of the church than to care for the people in our community. And in that way, we glorify God because God created this world, and though it is fallen and broken, we can celebrate still his redemptive work in creation. And we do that through caring for those around us, through loving our neighbor as ourself. It's been a hard week with the storms. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it just briefly later, but I just found myself uh, humbled in a good way and encouraged by the love of Christ's church, not just here in Rockford. That's just the one that I most closely felt because that's where I live. But all around the Midwest, tornadoes and storms ravaged, and you can hear stories of people coming together and caring for those around. And so I'm very thankful that we can live out one of the missions of the church, that we can be missiological, to use a fancy term, because I'm going to seminary, so we can be mission-minded so that God might be glorified. And there is no greater joy. But this week, we're going to be continuing in the book of Philippians. And since Dave is in Kenya, I hear he's watching online, but what he doesn't know is that we just kill, kill the feed after an hour and a half, and I'm just going to keep going. So I hope you guys are tucked in for a while. <laughs> If you could join me in flipping in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. If you are just joining us for the first time online or in person, I would encourage you to go back and listen through this series as we've been going through this small but very dense book of God's glory being revealed. As we continue in the letter this week, we're going to see the fifth or maybe sixth time, depending on how your particular translation renders it, where Paul is referencing joy and how joy is to be found. So to give you a few quick uh, summaries, Paul pointed the Philippian church to find joy first in the progress of the gospel. Then he pointed them to find joy in Paul's salvation. This is why we hear people's testimonies, because we want to find joy in the salvation of others. Then he pointed them to find joy in his potential freedom from prison, or inversely, even in death, that it would be death for the cause of Christ, to find joy there. And then to find joy, to find gladness in the potential of a visit from Timothy, and finally in the recovery of and return of Epaphroditus. So the passage that we're going to look at today starts with the sixth call to joy that Paul has in this letter. In my opinion, it's the most important of these calls to joy. And so, I hope that I gave you guys enough time to get there. I would encourage you, if you have a digital Bible, I love digital Bibles, I would encourage you to use an analog Bible if you need one. There's some in the pew. Um, it's easy for us, at least for me, to get so distracted when a text message comes through, when a little red notification is blinking at me, saying, check me, check me. And I would really encourage us as we sit here on Sunday mornings, and I know that I'm like becoming an old soul by saying this, but, <laughs> but it's so easy for us to get distracted that I would love for us to fully engage our minds and our bodies in the words which the Holy Spirit has preserved for us. So as we prepare our hearts and minds to read God's word, I'm going to pray this prayer that comes from the Middleburg Liturgy over us. Almighty God and most merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and fall down before your majesty, asking you from the bottom of our hearts that this seed of your word now sown among us may take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution cause it to wither, nor the thorny cares of this life choke it, but that as seed sown in good ground it may bring forth thirty, sixty, or a hundredfold as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. Amen. Philippians 3, starting in verse 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, 
Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. I find it interesting as I read through Philippians, and I would encourage you if you've never had an opportunity to do this or never taken the time to do this, to read this as it was originally written, which means take away the chapter headings, take away the paragraph headings, take away the verse numbers, read it as a letter. Because that's how it was intended. We break it up because it's easy, there's so much here, it's hard to find the address of where we're talking about with it, but I find it interesting that in this one pretty short letter, maybe longer than what we would handwrite nowadays because we have email and we have Google and things like that, but I find it interesting, and I, I guess I would challenge you to think on this, that in such a short letter, Paul is at least five times, if not six, challenging the church in Philippi to seek joy. Philippians is often referenced as like a book of joy, but I actually think more accurately it should be called a book towards joy. Because you don't tell someone who is already joyful what they need to focus on to be joyful. Right? You tell people who are anxious, who are lost, who are hurting, who are afraid. You tell them, no, don't focus on the things that you're, that you're seeing in front of you. Focus instead heavenward. Can any of you relate to that feeling, needing a little joy, especially after the storms of the past week, especially after the last decade of political and social unrest and difficulty, the the last several centuries of wars all throughout the world, does anybody find themselves beaten down and in need of a little bit of joy? Our joy, our joy, kind of culturally defined, tends to be found, and, and Dionysius actually beautifully referenced this, in this, in this tendency to, like, self-define ourselves, right? It's found in our successes or in our ambitions through external traits, through our self-determination, our independence, the things that we ascribe value to. We find we, we convince ourselves, and so much of culture is seeking to convince us that that's where we find joy. And Paul sets up in these few sentences something that should challenge all of us to turn that view on its head. That the things in this created world are not the place where you will find joy. We have the ability to serve others with abandon. We can let go of our self-ascribed identities, and we can serve those with whom sometimes we radically disagree. 
Because when we know Jesus, the one through whom all of creation was created, the one through whom you yourself were created, everything else dims in its apparent wonder. We cease, when we know Jesus, we cease looking with starry eyes and rose-colored glasses at the skin-deep values that this world offers and seeks to entice us with, and instead allow ourselves to become enraptured by the sight of a bloody cross in an empty tomb. So Paul tells the Philippians, and the Holy Spirit tells us through the preservation of this letter, to rejoice in Christ, because that is a safeguard for you. Rejoicing in Christ is where we find our safety. It's where we find our security. It's where we find our very stable ground in times of upheaval. Yet as humans, we're often quite bad at doing this, right? We're really bad at rejoicing in Christ. We attach all manner of surface-level identifiers to our understanding of holiness and God's blessing and favor. I thought as I was going through this, as I was preparing this message of this very short moment that happens in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, when the prophet Samuel is sent to the house of Jesse to anoint the coming king. He doesn't know who he is yet. God is going to uh, present him to Samuel. And in walks Eliab, uh, Jesse's oldest son. And Samuel thought to himself in 1 Samuel 16, 6, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Why would he think that? Well, we get a hint when God responds to him and rebukes him in the very next verse, 1 Samuel 16, 7, where it says that the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Let's pause right there for a second. How many of us can say that in our especially Americanized culture, we have an overabundance of preference, and I get that I can say this because like, I fall in the above average category of height, but like, we do put an overabundance of, of worth on people who are beautiful, beautiful, or tall, right? Other cultures, it might look different. Beauty certainly looks different in other cultures. Some cultures value height, but it's always external appearance. And so we see here that, that what Samuel is looking at is something that only goes skin deep. And the Lord says to Samuel, don't consider his height, his appearance, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And there are those brothers and sisters, and sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's you. There are those who believe unto Jesus for salvation, but they also believe that in, in, in the way that they act, somehow that this, this scandal of grace is somehow too easy. That somehow this idea of dying to ourselves, to die to our flesh and suffering for the sake of Christ isn't enough. We also have to look the part. So Paul warns us of those who pull away from this radical gospel of Jesus. He calls them dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh, which is like this really intense, really metal language, but like it's this, it's a reference, we think, to what were called the Judaizers. The Judaizers are a group of Christian believers of whom there were a spectrum of, of where they fell in their beliefs, but they all believed in observing Jewish cu customs, specifically the Torah, and some of them some of these Judaizers believe that the failure to follow the Torah and specifically the rite of circumcision was evidence of a lack of salvation. They believed that you were not actually fully in Christ until you had undergone the rite of circumcision. And Paul, who is pulling on language that goes all the way back to Deuteronomy when God said that he would circumcise our hearts, even back in the beginning, the point was never a physical outworking but an internal one, Paul, pulling on that language, makes certain that we understand that God's chosen people are not identified through the work of human hands, but that God has circumcised us in our hearts, that as the church, we are the circumcision. And in a beautiful rhetorical flourish, he has these three descriptors, dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh, and then he has three examples or three ways of thinking through being the true circumcision and he says, um, 
uh, we who serve God by his spirit, we who boast in Christ Jesus, and we who put no confidence in the flesh. Which camp do you fall into? I think if you are anything like me, more often than I'd like to admit, I fall into the camp of putting confidence in my flesh. Some of us boast not in Christ, but in our ability to reason. In this idea that intellectualism is the sublime reality of all of life. But we fail to realize that that immediately diminishes the value of those who are mentally challenged. Yet God is going to tell us that they are no less valuable because they are still created in the image of God. For some of us, we don't, put our, we don't boast in Christ. Instead, we boast in our savings accounts or in our 401ks or in our Roth IRAs. I'm set and secure. And so Paul, perhaps to head off maybe some arguments. Paul was a rhetorician, so he understood how arguments worked, which makes his language really confusing sometimes. But I think in an attempt to head off arguments that he could perceive of those saying, well, you're just saying this because you can't be as good at following the Torah as we are. So you're just saying we don't, that we don't put confidence in the flesh because you can't do it. Paul says, no, 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 no. Let me be clear. No matter what else someone claims as evidence of their blessed divine status based on the works of their flesh, Paul says, I have more. He had the right ethnicity. He had the right pedigree. He was like the conservative of conservatives. And here's the crazy truth of the gospel of Christ that Paul is desperately seeking for us and the Holy Spirit through him to understand, which is this. Your value and your identity are not based on what you do, what you look like, what you sound like. I'll add what you feel. They are based on the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so often we find ourselves anxious and afraid of the things that feel unknown to us, so we cling to the things we do know. I think Judaizers clung to the Torah because they knew it. It didn't feel as scary. And so Paul says, I had those things. Let me tell you about something better. Let me tell you about something greater. He says, I count those things as loss. He's talking in economic terms, right? You have profits or gains, and you have loss. He's saying, I am actually diminished if I hold to those things. What does he compare them to? Knowing Christ. Notice He's not subscribing or or promoting some sort of spiritual relativism in this moment. He's saying, I don't think, I've been shown revelation that tells me that these things that I believe were not the things to cling to. They were not the correct things. And he's not saying, so then anything must be the case. He's also not saying that these things don't have any value. And this is really important. He's not saying that ethnicity doesn't have value. He's not saying that education or zeal or tradition are not valuable. He's setting up a rhetorical argument comparing those things to knowing Christ. And he invites us to step into this comparison with the wholeness of who we are. Elsewhere in Scripture, we see Paul actually lifting up some of these things as things being used for God's redemptive purposes. We see him joyfully, I think kind of like cynically being like, I'm a Roman citizen. What do you mean you're going to send me away without a trial? We see him throughout Acts saying, I am a Hebrew. Listen, like, listen to me. I, I grew up in this. So he's not saying that these things are, inval- or are not valuable at all. He's comparing them. He's saying that holding on to these things as a means of identity in which you can find joyful fulfillment is not unlike in the midst of a storm dropping anchor into a crashing wave and expecting that wave to hold you still. When all along there's a dock right there for you to latch yourself to. Sometimes dropping anchor is good and it's the right thing to do. 
But that is not where you find safety and joy. I remember waking up in the middle of the night just over two years ago. It was 1 or 2 a.m. I was convinced when I woke up that I had broken my toe. The pain was just shooting through my body. I wasn't sure when I broke it, uh, perhaps earlier in the evening, and like my brain just like didn't catch up to the pain or something like that. But the weight of even that first layer of sheet, you know, the really light one that isn't very heavy, even that weight on my foot sent uh, spasms of pain through my body. I couldn't walk faster than a slow limping shuffle to put weight anywhere on any aspect of my foot sent pain throughout my body. And so in the morning, I texted the staff at the church I worked at the time, and I let them know I would be in late, and I headed off to urgent care. The doctor listened as I talked through the symptoms and the story of what happened. Um, I told her that I was convinced that I had broken my toe. And she said, well, well, we'll x-ray your foot, but it's more likely you have gout. I didn't know much about gout at the time. I knew people who had it. Here's what I did know about gout. It sounded gross. <laughs> right? It's, it's like the word moist. Right? Like, it just didn't sound... So I was like, can I please be a broken toe? And she's like, no, I think that, I think that you have gout. And so one x-ray later, no broken toe, pretty positive of a gout diagnosis. What proceeded over the next several months, and honestly still to a degree even to this day is that I'm still processing through what this means. Some of you have seen me limping around here when I have a gout flare-up, and, and I, I tend to, I don't walk as much on, on the platform as Dave does, but like when I do walk, I walk very fast, and some of you have been like, Michael, please stop moving so that I can talk to you for a moment. Um, but when I have a gout flare-up, I'm, I'm going at a snail's pace. What you may not know, the reason why this hit me so hard is that for a overwhelming majority of my formative years growing up, I was actually a ballet dancer. Dexterity, movement, mobility, controlled movement, these were core parts of how I saw myself, how I identified myself. And while I had allowed my body over time to take a more relaxed fitness approach, This, this gout diagnosis confronted me with an idol that I had in my self-described identity as somebody who could move freely. I was certain, after all, before this diagnosis, that should I truly desire to, I could relatively quickly get back into dancing shape and get back at it. But suddenly that was forced into my memory. I had this idol in my life. How arrogant of me to consider it Uh, mobility as something that gave me identity that was worth clinging to when I know so many in my life who live lives of limited mobility and perhaps have since they were born. But I didn't even realize I had this idol until I was confronted with it. And sometimes we have to be confronted with our idols. They're called blind spots because you can't see them. I hadn't submitted this aspect of who I was to Christ, and sometimes even these days, I still cling to it. When I'm not in the midst of a flare-up, I'm like, oh, everything's fine. I'll eat all the food I'm not supposed to eat, because it's not that bad. And then poor Naomi has to deal with me moaning and crying at night because I get this flare-up that sends pain everywhere. The point is this, that even still these days, even though I know these things cognitively, I still wrestle to submit my self-autonomy, my independence, my self-awareness, and my self-determination to Christ. What about you? How do you do with submitting all that you are to Christ? What idols do you cling to? After the storms of last weekend, I'm continuously thankful for the generosity of time, energy, people that poured out love in this local church and the church community. Naomi and I were hit with massive flooding in our basement. We didn't realize how bad it was until Dan and Cheryl were over there and sweating and being like, this is bad. And we were like, okay, good. Uh, we still didn't realize how bad it was, or at least I didn't. Naomi's smarter than me, so she might have, have already reached this part. But we had a restoration company come out Tuesday morning. Let me back this story up. On Monday, so we had the, the blessing of Dan and Cheryl Galvez and Tim and Margie Almond came to help 
with just all the stuff that we had to do. And between all of them, we, we sucked out probably 100 gallons or so of water out of our basement. A restoration company came Tuesday morning and much faster, praise the Lord, sucked out another 200 gallons of water out of our basement. Thanks to the prayers of this church, the help of good friends, we were able to make it through something that both threatened to overwhelm us, that threatened to cast a cloud over the joy in Christ we're called to have, but also threatened to allow us to sit, at least me, in the idol that I have in my own independence, which is that I was embarrassed to ask for help. In fact, I didn't ask for help, if I'm honest. I sent out a prayer request because I was, I was a little mean to Naomi that morning because of the overwhelm, and I sent out a prayer request I said, guys, I need prayer. We need prayer. We have the situation. And a friend texted and said, do you guys need help? And I don't know if you can relate to this. I sat there on my phone for about 30 seconds before typing the three letters, yes. Because it was so hard for me to say I did. Because I so idolized this idea that I am somehow supposed to do all of these things on my own. I don't know the first thing about flood recovery. What on earth? I'm a pastor and an artist. I'm bookish and I like art. Like, I'm, I'm out of my depth, pun intended, when, when it comes to flooding. But I am constantly confronted with these idols of self. And so Paul is saying all of these things that we cling to, this list isn't meant to be an exhaustive list of the things we cling to. It's, a, it's an example. So what are the things in your life that you are clinging to and placing as a higher priority than your spiritual life and the life of the ecclesial body, the church, the people that are to be your family? What is that thing? What are those things? Because Paul says he considers everything. He goes one step further than just this list. He says, now, what is more, I consider everything a loss a diminishment for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. There is nothing you can know, do, say, no title you can have, no feeling you can feel that is of more value to who you are as a person than knowing Jesus Christ. So I wonder, do you know him? I don't mean do you know about him. I don't mean can you answer trivia questions about scripture. Those are both good things. They're, they're, they're fine. I'm bad at Bible trivia. But I wonder, do you know the person of God himself who came to dwell physically among us and has sent his spirit to live in his people of the church? Because Paul gets a little spicy here. This passage can make people a little bit uncomfortable when they start to study it. Because he doesn't just stop at, I consider them as loss. I consider them as like an economic diminishment. He goes so far as to say what the NIV renders that he considers them garbage. I have one commentary. Listen, listen. This is not a nice word that he's using here in the Greek. I have one commentary that actually translates this passage. I consider them all crap. Because he considers them of such a low value. This word should make you uncomfortable that there is nothing in your life that when you compare it to the worth of knowing Christ even comes close in comparison. Nothing. Your job title, garbage. Your physical characteristics, garbage. Please hear, again, this is a comparison game. He's not saying these aren't things that don't have value in their right place. But the letters at the end of your name or the degrees that you have hanging on the wall, I have a degree hanging on my wall, please, right? Like, I like how the King James Version renders it, dung. <laughs> He's not declaring ontological value over these things. He's not saying that these things are inherently worthless. He's not being nihilistic. He's not saying you have no reason for living because all of these things are worthless. What he's saying is that when you compare the worth of anything to the worth of knowing Christ, it's a little bit like turning on a flashlight while you're standing next to the sun. No pun intended with that one. A flashlight has value in certain situations. The sun is overwhelming in comparison. And then he says this very strange thing. He says, I consider it all worthless, all garbage, all dung for the worth of knowing Christ, but he says he considers it garbage that he may gain Christ. He may gain. 
Christ. So in this weird divine way, he knows Christ and yet he has yet to gain him as well. And so too do each of us here today have the opportunity to know Christ and yet to gain more of him. Whether you are here and you call Christ Jesus as Lord or not, you have more Christ to gain. And then, and this is, can I be honest, this is the saddest part of the, of the message for me because there are these three messages, the three verses that Paul gives a summary of like these really big doctrines of the, of the Christian life. And I could um, very easily preach one message on each of these verses. And I don't have the time to do that as far as Dave knows. Um, and so <laughs> he, he gives us this three-point summary of the Christian life. He's like, he says this, I want to know Christ. What do I want to know? What is the importance of knowing Christ? First, we use the word justification. Justification. And he gives us this example or this descriptor of it in verse 9. That to know Christ is to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from those skin-deep things, Right? It doesn't come from the law, from some ability to work out our own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That's the first part of knowing Christ, to know that your righteousness doesn't come from any of those things that we so often attach value to and identity to. Instead, it comes from God on the basis of faith. And then in verse 10, um, he gives us this language that, that talks about, we might use the, the fancy word sanctification. So maybe you've heard the word sanctification in the church before. He again repeats, I want to know Christ. Yes, to the, know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Listen. It is really easy to convince somebody to come and worship a God who says, I want you all to have all of the health and wealth you can possibly have. It is much harder to help people see the wonder and the beauty that comes when we say we want you to come and worship a God who calls you to suffer with him. But that's our call. And we suffer not because God is some sort of masochist, but that through suffering, we first develop perseverance and endurance, which leads to character, specifically the character of Christ, but also so that we can learn to co-suffer with those who are also suffering in a world that is broken by sin because it has not yet reached its final redemption. That is the God who we serve, and that is a weighty call but it is a beautiful one. It is going and helping clean other people's yards when you yourself have trees down or helping clean up somebody else's basement from flooding when you yourself have flooding in the basement. Co-suffering. And so he says that we are to know the power of his resurrection, we are to participate in his sufferings, and we are to become like him in his death. If you haven't listened to the message from uh, about a month ago that, that Pastor Lee preached on Philippians 2, I would highly encourage you to go listen to it. He had this one little line in there that really popped out at me. I'm going to goof it up because I didn't write it down, so now I'm just going off memory. But it was said that the Christian call is the call to die. The call to die to ourselves for the sake of Christ and for the sake of others. And yet so often we cling to these things that we say give us our meaning and our value and identity. And Paul is saying, no, I'm calling you to a better way, a way that doesn't change with the shifting sands of culture or time, but a way that was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he shows us justification. He shows us sanctification, becoming like Christ. And then he says in verse 11, and so somehow... Attaining to the resurrection from the dead. There's a fancy word for this in the Christian world. We might call it glorification. And this is the idea that every single person sitting here, if you call on Christ as Lord, will be resurrected at the end of the age into a glorified body, a perfected body. 
You will feel no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. He will wipe away every tear when all of creation is fully redeemed again. You will be raised in glory. And this is important to understand in the eternal scheme of things because the point of the Christian life is not to escape your body or escape this creation. And this is a mentality that has crept into the church over the past like 50 years or so that the whole point of us living here is to get to heaven. That is not the point of us living here. The point of us living here is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The point of the Christian life is not to escape your body even as your body feels the effects of a sinful and broken world. The point here is that you will have a physical body in eternity. A physical body. There's this, um, I'm going to get nerdy for, I'm, I'm ahead of where I actually should be, so I'm going to get nerdy for one second. There is an old Greek philosophical thought called dualism, okay? I'm not going to quiz you guys on this, I promise. But dualism is this idea that, there, that we are constructed of body and soul, but really what is us is our soul, and thus that is the thing that needs to be preserved. So when we die, our soul detaches from our body, it sheds like a snake discarding its old skin, and it moves into its kind of perfected state. That is against the teaching of Scripture, and that is not what God calls us to, because God, before the fall, made you a human being body, and soul together. The point of the Christian life is not to escape this body. We can let go of the surface, skin-deep things and help those who look different, think different, uh, pray different, vote different, all of these things. We can help all of them. We can love them deeply because they are not the things that give us value and identity. The cross and the empty tomb are. We don't believe in Jesus and in heaven in order to escape the sufferings of this life, but rather to join in them and co-suffer. Remember the call of Paul, um, I guess, and if you're looking at the Pew Bible, it's, it's earlier in the page, but it's a page earlier in the letter, where he said that we're to do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility we're to value others above ourselves, the reason why we can do that is because the God of the universe condescended and demonstrated his ascribing value to us through nothing we've ever done. So why would we expect others to somehow live up to a standard we ourselves don't meet? This is a really hard thing to do, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is a really hard thing to do when we're clinging like the Judaizers to the marks of human working and fleshly ideation as evidence of godly status. But when we lay all that down, we have the opportunity to see with freshly unveiled eyes and the power of the Spirit that those humans around us who we sometimes look down on from our self-righteous pedestals are also made in the image of God. So Paul leaves us then with these last couple of verses, this rather quick statement, but it's a packed statement, where he says, these are not realities that I've yet attained to. They agree. (laughs) He says, it's a future goal. It's an eternal hope. Now, some of this was there were early church uh, Christian, uh, early believers who were concerned that the second coming of Christ had happened and they'd already been left. Paul is constantly saying, no, 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 no. You you will know, first of all. And also, like, I've seen Jesus. I know where my hope is. I'm still here. This is a future goal. It's an eternal hope. And until the consummation at the end of the age, he, Paul, welcomes us to run this race along with him, to strive ever onward for the prize. And again, the prize is not heaven. The prize is not health or wealth. The prize is that which surpasses all other things in value, knowing Christ Jesus. The second person of the Trinity, the very person of God who condescended to dwell among his creation, the prize is that by knowing Jesus, the Christ Messiah, and recognizing his immeasurable worth, we can suffer well 
Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Doesn't mean I don't have to limp when I have a gout flare-up or when I am confronted with my own um, desire to be independent. But we have the ability, the power in his strength to lay down our idols and we can care radically and deeply for those for whom the rest of society has cast aside and said you're worthless because you don't meet our unattainable standards. So brothers and sisters, may we press ever forward as we strive to rejoice in Christ alone. Like Paul, I would contend that none of us has attained this yet. May we press on heavenward, not because heaven is the thing that matters, but because of the one who there dwells. May we forget what is behind, not because we want to just pretend like the past isn't the past. Scripture calls us over and over again to remember the good things that God has done, but because we so often define ourselves by what has happened in the past instead of looking forward to what is coming. God can redeem all things. He started with you. He started with me. But too often we allow the hurts, the fears, the anxieties, the outward appearances that we have looked to in the past to define where we find our value and identity and we lose our eternal focus. So may we celebrate and remember God's good work in history and in our lives and may we encourage one another onward to rejoice in Christ through the submission of all we are to the grace and power that comes through the redemption of the cross and the power of the empty tomb. We don't do this separated from Christ. The very end, I think it's important, verse 14, where he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We are called heavenward in Christ Jesus. Which means you have access in a weird, divine, mysterious reality that I can't, certainly can't, comprehend, and were I God, I, as Tom Douglas has, has said this before, that he'd make a terrible Holy Spirit, and, and I also would make a terrible Holy Spirit. But we have the ability to run this race in Christ who allows us to partner with him in his power, in the endurance of his spirit, to focus on his will and his goals. And if you want to find joy if you want to find human flourishing that doesn't feel completely and totally reliant on how good the economy is doing or on who's president or who uh, your family is or whatever the thing is, you have to look outside of creation to the one who created it all. And so we don't do this separated from Christ. We are called heavenward in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus today? To him and him alone be the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You guys pray with me? Yeah, amen, amen. Father, we thank you that you look beyond the skin-deep things. I thank you, Lord, that I am not responsible for declaring my own value or my own identity because you have already done that work on the cross. And I thank you that I can stand in the power of the empty tomb and praise your name because of that work. Lord, I pray that you would confront us with the idols that we have in our lives. May we not leave here thinking, oh, this was just such a good, good message and I'm just so glad that I have this all perfect, Lord, but may we leave here refined in the fire of your Holy Spirit, conformed more into the image of your Son, Christ. May we allow the Scripture to confront us with the reality that we so often look too small and we have a big God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Father, for those who are here maybe aren't in you yet, Lord. I pray that, this, that your word would be compelling to them, that your spirit would compel them, that they might join the race to run heavenward in Christ Jesus, not to escape this reality, but to live more fully and more joyfully this side of eternity with the hope 
that someday all will be made new. Lord, we thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you that that wasn't the end of the story. And we pray for perseverance in our own lives and against the sin that still lingers. Search us, O oh Lord. Search us and heal us to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the band is already, uh, uh, anybody else for the band can start coming up. We're going to go to communion together. A um, few things I think are more important than going to communion after you hear something like that. So if the ushers want to bring forward elements, if you didn't grab elements on your way in, feel free to grab some from them. As we prepare our hearts for this, we're going to take some moments together to just silently consider this question. What are the idols of identity that I have placed over the cross of Christ? What are the markers of who I am that I need to bring low, that I need to consider as garbage? when compared to the worth of knowing Christ. Actually, can I, can I get some elements too? Sorry, I totally forgot to grab some. Thank you. Just ruined the moment there, guys. All right. So <laughs> we're going to take a minute to do that. Thanks, brother. And thank you to our usher team for helping out and greeter team for helping out when people like me forget. When you take these elements, this is not simply intended to be just like a rote thing that we do as people, a um, kind of uh, cultish inclusion thing. There's meaning that is inscribed in the act of taking communion together. You, by taking this, are proclaiming Christ his life, his death, his resurrection from the grave. So do you have something in your life that requires you to proclaim that gospel truth over? Do you have something in, the, in your life that you need to bring the power of salvation to bear on? To bring your tendencies to look like a Judaizer into submission. So let's silence our hearts for a moment and listen for the Lord to speak into our spiritual blind spots. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Let's take it together. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your communion. Thank you for your communion with us Thank you for giving us the ability to communion together and together join and proclaim that you have brought the kingdom into this world, 
you've died, you've resurrected. May we submit all that we are to you in all the ways of our life. In Jesus' name.